Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is fantastic to see you. Welcome. Welcome to our Classical Composer Casks. It is our virtual tasting for the month. It is a pleasure to have you with us tonight, uh, or if you're watching a few days later, uh, when you tune in then. Uh, my name is Andrew Derbidge. I'm the chairman of the Society here in Australia. And uh, normally for our virtual tastings, you'd see two faces here. Matt Bailey and I would be doing this together in tandem. Uh, what's actually happening tonight is uh, I'm flying solo because Mr. Bailey jumped on a plane and is headed to Edinburgh. So he's uh, over there at the moment. It's uh, nine hours behind where we are at the moment. So uh, lucky guys at the vaults right now um, having fun. But uh, in any event, we're going to have a fantastic time tonight. We have some amazing drams to go through together. Uh, we're going to explore some classical casks and some wonderful drops and uh, look forward to, to your company and uh, and having a great time together as we go through it all. Now, um, I'll be honest, this is the first time I've had to actually uh, act as producer as well and, and steer the ship. So I've got lots of controls and things to uh, bring into the mix. And um, uh, we may have some mixed success with that tonight. We'll see how we go. But uh, look, a, a couple of things just to uh, kick things off in terms of announcements and getting things underway. Um, of course, uh, we're just about to put to, to, put to bed our, our um, uh, molten and music theme for, for the last two outturns, and we'll shortly be launching um, next month's outturn, which it actually looks a little bit like this. And uh, we always work our, our outturns ahead, so uh, this one will be sent out to members very shortly. Uh, you'll be receiving it in due course, and uh, that's got some fantastic things in it. Next month is Festivals Month, the, this, this big thing for the society, huge thing we do these days, uh, celebrating all the different festivals um, in the society, uh, sorry, in, in Scotland. And the society has done some amazing festival bottlings uh, this year. And uh, next month is what that's all about. We're going to be releasing them, all of the society's festival bottlings through the month. Uh, they look a little bit like that. And um, you'll have the chance to taste those if you get along to some of our events. And uh, keep an eye out in your local city, in your local area. Uh, there's a few that are, are coming up at the moment, and you will see there the word festivals appearing in all four of those, uh, and they're going to be a great time to taste some amazing drams. So do please look out for that. Um, so that's that element of things. And uh, classical casks, malts and music. What makes tonight's classical cast? Well, last month we had our... Um, Rock and Rollers of Rum, which was a fantastic event. And uh, I think when you look at, at classical uh, malts, it's certainly it's a word that's used in, in, in uh, whiskey all the time. Oh, this is a classic whiskey. It's a classic style. And um, I guess uh, some of the whiskies we're going to try tonight have that element uh, going on to them. And, uh, you know, I think when you look at classical music, a lot of people appreciate, um, associate that with the composers of the, of the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, for example, uh, some of the we've got four distilleries we're tasting tonight that were all founded at the, at the start, the first quarter of the, the 19th century, the early 1800s. And in that era, you've got uh, composers like Wagner, Schumann, Mendelssohn, uh, Beethoven. Beethoven actually died three or four years after four of our whiskies tonight were, were founded. So, um, and they really are classic whiskies. We're going to be exploring some whiskies tonight that have come from that, that classic, uh, four of them come from Speyside, that classic Speyside style. Um, uh, they're very clean, they're uh, bourbon cast matured, first fills, so they really are spectacular in that respect. And we'll we'll check those out as we as we go through each one. Um, and look, normally Matt and I would be uh, exchanging a bit of banter and going backwards and forwards between the two of us. Uh, flying solo tonight, I'm very much relying on your comments, so do please uh, send them through and um, we'll check those out. And if I can bring them up on the screen, that'd be great as well. So certainly would encourage your comments and contribution. Bear with me just a moment. Now, in case you're wondering, I said four of whiskies, four of our whiskies tonight come from Speyside, and that is the Spey River just behind me. And you can see in our studio here, I'm a bit limited. There you go, my hands disappear already. Uh, that's the Spey River. That's the, the Craig Gellicky Bridge. Uh, being a structural engineer, I'm obliged to show a picture of a bridge in every presentation I do. So there you go. I can claim a tax, tax deduction for that one now. Excuse me one moment. And the Spey River meanders its way through in many um, uh, parts of, of, of space. And a lot of distilleries popped up around it. And just to give you a little insight into that, let's just have a look at this graphic here for a moment. 
Um, the space side region there is uh, that area up in red, and you can see Inverness here, um, Aberdeen over to the east, Glasgow and Edinburgh there. And uh, four of our whiskies tonight come in a very, very close proximity uh, to one another in that red zone. And in fact, I've brought them up here. They're four of the distilleries we're, we're tasting tonight. Uh, Linkwood, Dalyuan, Ben Renners and Glenlivet. And you can see they arguably stretch from the northern end of Speyside to the southern end. And uh, it's amazing that those distilleries are so close together. Um, and, you know, if those are people who get caught up about regionality and, and you know, whiskies being from the same district or region having a similar style, uh, we're going to sort of smash that, that, that myth tonight. That even though these four distilleries are in very close proximity, they are remarkably different. Um, and then we're going to finish off with uh, the representative from Isla tonight as well. So, look, I just wanted to bring that up, uh, show you that for context. And look, without further ado, we should probably get stuck straight into things. And we're going to do that with our first whiskey of the night. Now, uh, these we're going to do them in a slightly different order to uh, your tasting map. Uh, we're going to kick off uh, with 39.215 tonight. Uh, which is high bore diluting juice. It's an 11 year old. Uh, it's from a first fill bourbon barrel. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in just a moment, but you're probably all one step ahead of me and uh, pouring and I'm gonna do that right now. So this is distillery 39 and uh, distillery 39, uh, when you way back when the Australian branch actually launched uh, in Australia in 2002 and for the first four or five years, uh, your membership perk for, for joining the society, you would actually receive a bottle uh, of, of society whiskey bottle from uh, Distillery 39. Um, so for members who've, who've been around for uh, really 20 years this year, uh, you might remember your, your first society bottling being a, a 39. Distillery uh, at the top end of Speyside, as we saw in that previous graphic. Um, oh, I've just realised something else. I can actually bring that in. Oh, look at that. It's all it's all working. Um, yeah, up in the, the top of Speyside there. Um, and it was founded in 1821, uh, went through a, a, a refurb in 18, sorry, 1962, 140 years later. Big expansion in the 70s, and that's going to be a common theme with some of our whiskies tonight in the in the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, expansions took place, refurbishments, buyouts occurred, uh, and a big expansion in 2013 as well. Uh, why don't we have a quick look at the, uh, the distillery while we're at it? And you can see here, there's the original maltings um, from, the, from the distillery, no longer in use these days, and you can see a far more modern uh, plant facility there. Uh, which, as I said, that's the function of the 2013 um, refurbishment that took place at that time. Uh, again, please send your comments in. I've seen a comment that's just popped up here. Uh, will there ever be a Perth event? There are Perth events all the time. We do lots over there. Uh, we've just been struggling with COVID for the last couple of years and lockdowns in WA, but uh, it's going to happen. All right, so let's have a nose of that. Well. You'd have to say it's classic space side, isn't it? Classical space side drop. Beautiful nose. Now, this is in our juicy oak and vanilla flavor profile. And uh, not surprisingly, I'm getting vanilla and that juicy oak. It's a distillery. It's New Make Spirit is, is probably renowned for, uh, for having a, a fruity edge, very malty. As I say, very clean. 11 years old in a first world bourbon barrel. So you're getting that beautiful uh, vanilla from the, from the American oak coming through. Mm. And for the first whiskey for the night, that's a great start. Comes in at an ABV of 56.2%, which I, I think in my opinion tonight is very pleasant and comfortable. I don't uh, I don't feel a strong need to, to have to water that down. And a beautiful, nice, clean finish as well. Certainly coming through wonderfully there. And uh, look, most of the viewers here will, will know the tricks, but uh, certainly don't just take a sip of a whiskey and and then move on and, and feel that you've captured the, captured the the all the whiskey's nuances and styles. Car strength whiskeys, in particular, change over time as those volatiles evaporate, um, 
and uh, that whiskey will change. And, you know, over the course of, in the old days of the tasting panel, we would take 20, 25 minutes to uh, to go through the, each whiskey and assess them and really milk out everything that was there on the nose and the palate. And you can certainly put your hand on top, agitate that. And as you keep going back to these Car Strength Society whiskies over, uh, you know, three, four, five minutes, uh, they just continue to give and expand and change. Uh, I can see Dave Cooks just uh, chimed in with a with a comment there. Um, I went to the Perth event uh, late November last year, so yeah, they they do exist. Uh, oh, I've got to bring my mouse to the right spot. There we go. Can I bring that up? Oh, it works. Look at that. Beautiful. What a lovely drop. Anyone, uh, for the viewers at home, if any, has anyone felt the need to add water, I wonder? Well, I'm certainly very comfortable with that one. The real whiskey nerds out there might know uh, some quirky facts about this distillery. Um, it was, as I say, founded in 1821, had a refurb in 1962, and then it was in 1971 uh, that they built four new stills in addition to the two that were there. And those four new stills became uh, known as uh, Distillery B for this distillery. And Distillery A kept on producing. And Distillery A, the original one with two stills, actually became an experimental distillery uh, where they would try new experiments, uh, new makes, uh, variations on uh, their cut points and all those sorts of things. And uh, that continued for some time, although that actually closed uh, in 1996 was the last time uh, that that was fired up. So all the all the uh, spirit that we get from this distillery these days, you know, comes from uh, the, the main complex. And again, you can see that there um, and again, expanded. Um, I think I'm right in saying it's got, oh, I might get this wrong, eight or ten stills these days. So it's certainly grown over time. And it's a distillery that you won't find at your local bottle shop. There's no commercial expression available. So uh, if you can find this distillery, it will be through the independence. So a lovely drop and a great one to kick things off. Just looking at some other comments here. Now, Dave Cook just asked a fantastic question. Will these bottlings be available for purchase at some point? Yes and no. Some of our whiskies tonight are indeed available for purchase. In fact, they're available for purchase right now, including this one. This very one here has 11 bottles available on the website at the moment. So if you want to uh, swing by the website and grab yourself one of those, uh, and as we come to each whiskey tonight, I'll let you know what the what the status is. Just another thing to let you know also, we're having a preview tonight. Uh, some, one of the whiskies we're having is something that's going to be released on our June outturn. So those of you participating in this tasting tonight are getting a sneak peek. Lovely drop. Well, look, this is the great tragedy of our virtual tastings. I, I could sit here and just nose and, and this all night and, and keep on sipping it, but that gets to be a slightly boring television after a while and boring viewing. So we should probably move on. And you'll need to bear with me one moment while I just play around with some things here. Uh, again, forgive me, this is my first time behind the uh, the steering wheel here. And our next cab off the rank is going to be two, 1.26. A wonderful distillery, very famous distillery. I'm sure most of you know, uh, know this one. I'm very careful. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit old school with the society. I, I uh, became involved back in the days when uh, there was some very strict rules about not mentioning the distillery name. So that's why I'm doing my darndest uh, not to do that. So I'm going to keep referring to these things as this distillery and that distillery. Um, of course, with the joys of the internet these days, uh, I know you can all go off and find out which one is distillery number two. But uh, very, very famous. Second biggest selling whiskey in the world these days. Biggest second selling single malt, I should say. So Smith's Quadrilogy, if you're wondering about that name, uh, Smith, well, John Smith was the, the founder of this distillery. Um, way back in, uh, well, it existed uh, in the very early 1800s, but uh, it was officially founded in 1824 when it became legal. Uh, founded by John Smith, and it actually stayed in family hands more or less until uh, the 1950s when it merged with uh, the Glen Grant Company and then uh, certainly became a, a multinational. It was bought out uh, in 1970 and then 78 by Seagram's. <clears throat> so, if, you know, for the best part of 150, 160 years, it was a, a, a family-owned distillery. And again, we're still in Speyside, very famous Speyside distillery. 
But uh, this one's in our sweet, fruity, and mellow flavor profile. Uh, again, it's a, it's a bourbon cask, first fill bourbon barrel. That first fill is important. It means that the, the previous filling in this cask was, was bourbon. We tip the bourbon out. We put this spirit in. We let it sit there for 14 years uh, and then bottle it. And this is what you're enjoying tonight. What a lovely nose again. And um, I can see why it's in the sweet, fruity and mellow flavor profile. There's certainly a, a, a fruitiness to that uh, that comes through. And the distillery is famous for uh, it, it, there's a citrus that comes through on its spirit as well. Wow. Now, those of you that are familiar with the uh, the 12 year old, the commercial expression, this will be familiar. There's some certain similarities there in the DNA. But what I love about, and this is the joy of car strength whiskey, and more importantly, non chill filtered car strength whiskey, all those oils and congeners and fats are in the spirit there because they haven't been filtered out. And you're just getting a beautiful mouthfeel, a wonderful experience. Is it classical? Is it that classic space side thing? Yeah, I, I believe it is. Now, sadly, uh, this whiskey is sold out. We do not have any other bottles of this. Uh, and there's two ways to look at that. You can say, well, sadly, it's gone. There's, we don't, uh, not available to, to, to uh, purchase. But by the same token, we can say, this is a magical experience. It's sold out, it's gone. And yet by participating in our virtual tasting tonight, you get to have a taste of it, which is fantastic. I am tremendously enjoying the mouthfeel of that whiskey. It's it's salivating. It's it's uh, drawing out the juices. Mouth watering. What a, a lovely drop. Now this is a distillery I have strong affinity for. Uh, I I love the brand. I love the people behind the brand. Um, and I've been to the distillery many times. Uh, in fact, uh, when we, we've done the, the Ultimate Whiskey Tour to Scotland, uh, the Australian branch has done four uh, Ultimate Whiskey Tours to Scotland now. Uh, in 2009, 11, 14 and 17 was our last one. And we always make a point of going to this distillery. Uh, there's a photograph I took uh, when we were last there. You can probably just see a couple of society members tucked around the back of that's still there. Uh, this distillery now has three still houses, would you believe? It is so large these days. This is actually, uh, this is the, the, the second of the, the three still houses. And each one almost runs as its own independent distillery, uh, all obviously going through the same, um, using the same, uh, you know, uh, wash, barley, um, and, and all the rest of it, uh, and same, same stills. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can see, if those of you are interested, you can see the wash stills on the right and those are the spirit stills on the left. And all of that is controlled by one person who sits behind a computer, uh, pretty much where I took that photo from, actually. I think I took that photo from the control desk. Uh, so yeah, that's the, the modern side, of course. Uh, that still house was built in um, and came online 2009, 2010. Uh, the, uh, one of the earlier incarnations, what we now know still house one is... Uh, off back behind to the right, uh, and obviously much, much older. And these are the things that you don't quite appreciate when you go to your local bottle shop and just you know get a bottle of, of uh, standard 12-year-old. You may not know um, that it came from one of three different uh, still houses, but obviously from the one distillery and therefore a single malt. Oh, Mark, uh, also known as Whiskey is My Jam. I've just seen a, a, your comment here. Um, was fortunate enough to receive a two dot from the recent referral offer. It's good score, sir. That is, that is excellent. Well done. There's probably a few viewers a bit jealous of that, I'd suggest. Uh, well done to you, sir. <coughs> Forgive me one moment. This is that awkward thing when you're doing a, a, a live tasting and uh, your throat decides to give out. I'm out of training. Of course, uh, on a normal virtual tasting, uh, my colleague Matt would be doing half the talking with me, but I've got to make up for both of us tonight. So look, that was indeed a lovely drop. And uh, can I give you, encourage you, uh, if you've left some in your glass or if you've still got some in your little uh, sample bottle, just put that to one side and come back to that a little later on because that is that is a whiskey that I can guarantee you is going to change and improve over time. 
improve is perhaps the wrong word, expand and change. I think you'll, you'll come back to that in five, 10 minutes uh, and find that it's uh, it's really moved on to become something else. Let me make that little caption go away there. There we go. Oh, look, cooking, cooking with gas. So number three, now this, this is a treat. This is special. So our third whiskey tonight is in the middle of your tasting, Matt. Uh, magical, tranquil and dreamy. Look at that. What a treat. So it's a, a distillery that, you know, oh, look, you, you, you do see a few commercial bottlings. And, um, sorry, I beg your pardon, not this one. Uh, you won't find too many now that I think about it. Uh, distillery 36. Uh, very much part uh, of um, what we call the Diageo these days, uh, you know, the big company responsible for the Johnny Walker blends and the like. And this distillery chiefly produces its whiskey um, for for the, the the blends, hence rarely seen as a single malt, um, certainly rarely seen as a 23-year-old. And uh, how rare is this? Well, I'll tell you now, folks, we have one bottle left on the website. So uh, those of you who are keen, jump in quickly and give that one a go. So we are on whiskey number three, cast 36.177, magical, tranquil, and dreamy. And what I should do is perhaps bring that up. So a 23-year-old, very much in the heart of Speyside. Uh, as you drive up uh, the main road through the heart of Speyside, you can you see this off to the right-hand side. <clears throat> That's the nearest neighbour, I think I'm right in saying, is Glen Farkless. Uh, and Ben Rennes is, is the big hill uh, behind the distillery, um, Ben effectively being the, um, uh, the Gaelic word for hill in this case. Now, it's 61%. That's the other thing, too. Uh, 23 years old, and yet amazingly uh, has a still has an alcohol percentage north of 60, 61, in fact. Fascinating distillery. Again, founded in 1826, so uh, like like the three predecessors so far. We've, uh, our three whiskeys might have been founded in 1821, 1824, 1826, that classical era. Uh, you might question that, by the way. That's because of the, uh, the Excise Act, which came in in 80, 1823. Uh, which suddenly um, made founding a distillery and doing it legally a, a lot more attractive. And this was distilled back in the 15th of August, 1997. Think back to what you might have been doing in 1997. Wonderful, wonderful time capsule. So, yeah, the distillery was founded in 1826 and it had a... a a really unfortunate uh, history in life, actually. It was only around for three years when it was destroyed by a... Um, uh, fire, flood, a big one, floods. Floods went through in 1829. Uh, that's the, 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 uh, the, the, it's funny, distilleries needed to find themselves, uh, be founded right next to a good source of water. So planting your distillery near the River Spey was, it was a fantastic way to collect your water. Um, but it also put yourself in a floodplain. So this distillery was destroyed by fire in, uh, in 1829. Sorry, flood, I'll get it right, flood in 1829. Then distill, uh, destroyed by fire in 1896. Got bought by John Dewar uh, in 1922. Dewar is the famous blend. And then uh, the DCL, what we now know as Diageo today, acquired in 1925. So it's actually been owned by effectively, let's for want of a better word, you call it the Johnny Walker Group now for nearly 100 years, which is quite extraordinary. And the distillery got completely rebuilt in 1956. Uh, there you can see there. So very very well i say very modern uh, modern buildings for the 1950s anyway and you also get a bit of an insight there into just the Speyside district and the Speyside region just have a look in the background there uh farming and whiskey making that's pretty much the two things you do in uh in Speyside. i often say if, you, if, you, if you're born and you grow up in Speyside, you do one of three things you either get involved in whiskey production or farming or you uh you move to edinburgh or glasgow <clears throat> now, being a 23-year-old, I'm a big believer that old whiskies deserve a bit of time and a bit of patience and a bit of respect. And I haven't tasted this yet. Uh, I've been talking about it all this time and I've only been nosing it. So just bear with me a few moments while I go in for that sip. Those of you who are ahead of me, again, please uh, throw up a few comments. Darren's actually asked a... Um, 
complex question here. Any info on the flavour input of such wa large wash stills? Oh, look, I don't think the size of the wash still is too important. It's probably more important um, how they run it, how fast they run their distillation, uh, how aggressively, I, I, I should say. Um, obviously, uh, goes through. I, what I've missed, sorry, Darren, is whether that's a question relating to, uh, I'm guessing that's a question relating to uh, our, our preceding whiskey. But yeah, uh, size doesn't matter too much. It's more shape. Boy, that's, uh, there's a line there. I wish I had someone to bounce that one off. We'll let that one go through to the keeper. Wow. I think we're spoiled these days. I think, uh, you know, the old, older whiskey you, you can find at the society still bottles plenty of it. Uh, you know, I remember there was a time when the, the opportunity to taste a 23 year old was something that you'd, uh, you'd feel very privileged about. Uh, now we encounter it all the time, but you know, I guess uh, for people perhaps newer to whiskey, for those that are uh, maybe starting out and just buying sort of the 10 year old, 12 year old, 15 year old expressions, really a special experience to um, try something that's 23 years old. Oh, I know there's a couple of members uh, on our books that are, that are quite young. This is actually older than them. And uh, that's a great thing, tasting whiskey that's older than yourself. Which I have to tell you, at my point in life, is getting increasingly uh, harder and certainly more expensive. Wow. I mentioned earlier this uh, the big red, um, let's call it a chimney for want of a better term. Uh, the red chimney is visible from the, the, the main drag. Uh, so uh, as you drive around Speyside, you can usually pick the distilleries by the, uh, uh, you know, the, the big um, gas outlets and, and, and chimneys and the rest. But that one certainly stands head and shoulders above anything else in, in that neck of the woods. Oh, Darren, great question. Let's bring that one up. How do you define old and dignified from a flavour viewpoint? Um, Look, I think uh, this is a hard one to answer unless you've been drinking whiskey for quite some time. I think everything uh, revolves around context and experience. Uh, and, and I'll go back to that word, context. And in order to know what an old whiskey tastes like, you've got to compare it to a young whiskey. And then you've got to try a few old whiskies over time to sort of start to look for those, um, I guess, those notes and those nuances um, that, uh, that display themselves. And I guess... A really simple answer would just be oak. Obviously, as whiskies get older, they spend more time in the wood and they start to take on some of that oakiness. And um, there's a, I, for me personally, I think there's there's almost a, a transition point that I think once a whiskey gets north of 19, 20 years old, uh, if you know the the characteristics to look for on the palate and even the mouthfeel as well, you start to note notice that oak come through. And certainly whiskies that are north of 30 years, 30 years old really um, uh, can exhibit that 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 oakiness and that sometimes those rancio notes. Um, and then I think that straight away puts it in the flavour uh, profile of old. As for dignified, I think that's a really interesting word. How do we, let's look at the opposite end. How do we describe whiskies that are, um, are, are young? You know, we, we use words like uh, vibrant, uh, boisterous, um, aggressive, um, the more time the whiskey spends in the barrel and it's maturing nicely, you start to, uh, uh, those volatiles start to, to, to wear off, uh, disappear, and, the, and uh, a more a level of uh, refinement and maturity comes on. And, uh, and I guess that's that dignified uh, element that we'd look for. So um, it's not entirely tangible, Darren, I, I confess, but uh, hopefully I've gone some way to answering your, your questions there. Little comment here. Uh, I'll bring that up. Yeah, it's a fair, it's a fair question. I think we need to slow down. It's a school night. I'm sorry. I'm, I am racing through them. As I said, normally with uh, with Matt here, we'd we'd probably uh, uh, have a bit more uh, blether and banter to to drag things out a bit. The other side of the equation is these are just really tasty. I just want to keep drinking them. Lovely drop. And can I say, starting to really come to life too. I touched on this with the last one. You know, car strength whiskies take a bit of time to unravel. Older whiskies take a bit of time to unravel. There was a rule of thumb. It appeared in a whiskey textbook in the 1980s. I can't remember who wrote it now, but suddenly it became um, it became fact. You know, uh, just one of those things that everyone referenced. But there was a, a, a point of view that um, 
uh, you should leave a whiskey one minute for every every year that it was. So that if a whiskey was 20 years old, you should pour it and leave it 20 minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that was that, that, that was a wonderful thing at the time. I think we just didn't have the patience for that anymore. But certainly, you know, by that rule of thumb, you could let this sit for 23 minutes for it to really come to life. And uh, yeah, I think um, I think this is actually really starting to, to come alive now uh, as some of those uh, things are, are starting to awaken. Um, a lot of people would try and uh, accelerate that process by adding a few drops of water. But the, the trouble is, of course, older whiskies tend not to like water. So you need to be very careful doing that. I'm not going to do that tonight myself. But if uh, anyone at home is uh, wants to add a few drops of water and then share with the group uh, how they think uh, that changed or whether it improved, I'd certainly uh, welcome your thoughts. Mark's asked a question here. Um, the youngest old and dignified SMS, SMWS. Um, Late teens, undoubtedly. Look, I, I can't reference it. I can't uh, put my finger exactly on what it was, but um, old and dignified is a flavour profile. Uh, there would certainly be some younger whiskies in their teens that would match that profile. So yeah, there would certainly uh, be some that have that have had that um, uh, that categorisation. So look, I'm going to put that off to one side, and I know that's going to develop further as the night goes on. And so I've left a little bit in the dram there. And what we're going to do is move on to our next whiskey, which I will bring up here. We're on to whiskey number four now, cask 41.141, whittling over a barbecue. And I have to say, whoever put the caps on our uh, sample bottles this month did a great job there. <laughs> They're hard to come off. Bit more colour on this one. I hope you noticed that straight away. Always look at the colour when you're dealing with society whiskies. If you buy a whiskey at your local bottle shop, don't pay too much attention to the colour because it's probably got artificial colouring in it. But the society does not do that. Our whiskies are natural colour. And so uh, if you see something that's darker, you know that there's a contributing factor to that that's not artificial. It's either, uh, it's well, it is genuinely the, the, the cask uh, that it came out of and the amount of time it spent in that cask. Wow. So again, another distillery from Speyside that you don't see very often. It's not really a bottle officially. It doesn't have a commercial release. Uh, it was founded in 1852. And uh, this one's pretty special. It was uh, matured for 11 years in an American oak, Oloroso Sherry Butt. And then uh, we at the Society transferred it into a first fill Spanish oak, uh, Petra Jimenez cask. A lot of confusion about that, um, American oak, European oak or Spanish oak, and then uh, ex-bourbon, ex-sherry, and then the different types of sherries. Um, it's forgotten that the majority of sherry houses in Spain actually use American oak casks. So when you see American oak, don't think bourbon. Uh, that's not what they're referring to. It's the species of oak, Quercus alba, and that uh, that uh, American oak uh, has one, some wonderful features that make it ideal for maturing all sorts of liquids and spirits and wines in, you know, particularly sherry. And so the majority of sherry produced in Spain is matured in American oak. Having said that, uh, Spanish oak or European oak, uh, Quercus robur, uh, impart some amazing characteristics uh, onto sherry and then subsequently onto whiskey. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds here. You've had that three year extra maturation, uh, in uh oh, sorry two years i should say two years extra maturation in the uh spanish oak and at pedro jimenez rather than uh, oloroso so surprise surprise the notes we're getting here are sherry and it's obviously therefore got some real it's got that wininess the sweetness uh the dried fruits that make it very different to the three preceding whiskies comment from darren there getting loads of spice and awesome dryness <laughs> That dryness is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, that's certainly, uh, I guess, one of the um, things that comes hand in hand with uh, with wine casks and sherry casks. And there's a very valid point. So this distillery, um, interesting name, hard to pronounce. Uh, I'm not going to do it anyway, but that's fine. And uh, folks, you're enjoying a treat tonight. You are the first people in Australia to try this. And uh, this is actually going to appear on our June outturn. So we're doing a, a sneak preview tonight. Now, it will appear on the June outturn. We've put a uh, ring fence to a, a number of them 
to be featured in June, but we thought it would be really cruel tonight to uh, give you a chance to taste this and then not have the opportunity to buy it if you enjoy it. So there are actually 14 bottles of this on the website, uh, which went up uh, at the start at 7 o'clock. I was holding that back. So uh, if you're really enjoying this and you want to grab yourself a bottle, you'll find 14 bottles on the website right now. Uh, and if you'd prefer to wait till June, well, you can uh, roll the dice then as well. And I can see here, uh, Darren has wasted no time. Ordered. Nice one, my friend. So look, all of our distilleries that we've tried tonight uh, so far all have something in common. Um, these four so far, they all come from Speyside. They're all founded in the in the uh, the nineteenth century, and they've all had a pretty nasty history of of mishaps. Uh, so this was founded in eighteen fifty two. Uh, in 1916, it was acquired by, by John Dewar and Sons, so obviously a key part to the Dewar's blend. Uh, and then in 1917, it was almost completely destroyed by fire, such that it took three years to rebuild. So it didn't come back on streaming until 1920. In 1925, it got, uh, it got acquired by the DCL, the Distillery Company Limited, which, as we've said already, uh, went on to become what we now know as Diageo today. Um, and like all the pre preceding whiskies tonight, uh, it had a major refurb in the 1960s. Interesting, in 1965, it switched to steam heating, uh, one of the early distilleries to, to, to take up that. Up to that point, you know, distilleries were all burning, uh, well, basically coal and direct firing their stills. In the 1960s, they, they thought they'd try out steam heating. Uh, and in 1983, the local maltings changed. So from, from 1983 onwards, this distillery was getting its malt in from a commercial maltster, a common source. And I think that's interesting. When you when you read a lot of commentary about whiskey and distilleries, there's a lot of talk about, oh, it's not like how it used to be or it's changed over time. And I find it very interesting when, when people uh, make those comments these days because we're talking about changes that occurred back in the 1960s, um, you know, 50, 60 years ago now. Uh, and so when I, I read that from a whiskey commentator or writer who's in their 30s or 40s, I think, huh, uh, that changed long before you even arrived on the planet. So it's funny. I think I think I love the traditions of whiskey uh, and the whiskey industry, and I certainly love heritage and I pay my respect to heritage. Um, but then again, I, I think it's funny how people lament changes that happened decades before uh, they even entered the scene and, and the whiskies that they've, they've tried these days. Sometimes I think we get we get hung up on uh, on the trivia distillery rather than uh, just simply what they're making and the the quality of what's in the the glass. And this is an absolute treat. I'd love some tasting notes, folks. If uh, if anyone wants to contribute with some thoughts, again coming from a sherry cast straight away, you do, you're getting those spicy notes, dried fruits, raisins, plums. There's a there's a Red currant note, I'm getting on the nose there. Thank you, Darren, for your input there. Yeah, and I agree with your comment there exactly. Beautiful nose. The sherry isn't flogging the floral notes. Beautifully balanced. Oh, you use the B word. I love you. I love balance is so important in whiskey. I think uh, we get excited when someone turns the volume up to, to 10 or 11 and you get, you know, you, people talk about the massive peat or the massive sherry. Look, they're wonderful things, and sometimes that's what you're looking for, but I think balance is also important. You don't want something to overwhelm or dominate the spirit in such a way that it's at the expense of other things. You know, the distillers went to a lot of effort, uh, or the brewers, I should say, the brewers went to a lot of effort to create the flavours during fermentation. The, the distiller uh, refined those in what came out of the still and the spirit, and I think sometimes you can put it in a bombastic cask that just overwhelms and pounds those things away, and and, and you lose the nuances and all the skills of the preceding uh, trades that, that that passed before you. And I think sometimes we've, sometimes we've got to be careful about when wood and particularly sherry oak just comes in and dominates things. Don't get me wrong. Uh, sometimes a, a massive kick of sherry in the face is what you're looking for. But uh, I agree with you, Darren. There's, there's a balance to this, which is just wonderful. The closest you'll get to the old commercial bottling of this was um, uh, the flora and fauna range. And I think it was as a 16 year old, I think they, they brought out uh, for this one, which was a sherry, uh, a very heavily sherry dram, actually, as it turns out. What a wonderful drop. You know what? I'm going to do something I wouldn't normally do. I'm going to add a few drops of water to this one because I think it could do with it. And 
I'm going to be on brand here. Check it out. Actual society carafe. Now, the great Jim McEwen, who'd be known to many of you, the wonderful distiller at, uh, at Bamore for 40 odd years before moving on to uh, uh, Brook Laddie. He was a firm believer that sherried whiskies didn't necessarily take water. I beg to differ occasionally. I think it's a rule of thumb. It's not a bad thing to abide by. But folks, oh, you must do this, please. If you're at home and you've got some left in your glass, add a few drops of water. That has just exploded the fruit. Uh, Darren, you comment here about the sherries and flogging the floral notes. Add a few drops of water and out comes the florals and the fruit. Quite extraordinary. Wow. It really is floral. I'm, I'm, I'm going to maybe subtract my reference to fruit there and, and push forward the, the, the floral barrel. Wow. Let's just have a look at the uh, distillery too, which I'll do in just a second. There we go. Now, I've taken a few. I've been to this distillery a couple of times. I've taken a couple of photos. Um, it's a really hard one to photograph, actually. The, the most scenic uh, building is uh let me just maximize that for you uh this little element just here where i've got my hand um which is just the admin office nothing to do with the distillery which is all back here uh so hard one to capture and i'll be honest i lifted this off uh off uh, the internet in fact don't look too closely you might actually see a watermark on that but uh yeah again you can see the mix and match of a distillery that uh, was founded in 1856 and has just been expanded and extended to over the years including architecturally some fairly um unsympathetic additions in the 1960s as well. Oh, this is what I like to see. Jaden, you're a champion. Haven't even tried it, but it sounds amazing. <laughs> I love I love that attitude. Oh, sir, uh, well done to you. Again, folks, please, add, have you added that drop of water? It uh, really expands it. That's on the nose. I haven't even tasted it yet uh, with, with water. Let's just uh, see what it does for the palate with a drop of water. Okay, Mark's asked a great question here. It did not escape my notice. I saw that as well. Explain the train. Um, well, look, you can see the tracks there uh, going into the uh, into the building. Um, there is uh, a train. Oh, gosh, you know, I could bore you for a few minutes whilst I went looking for a photograph on my computer here. Uh, there is a, um, uh, let's call it a, no a novelty steam train journey that goes up uh, the Speyside uh, Railway. Um, and I'm get, it looks exactly like that. I've, I've seen it shunt past me a few times. I've actually been on the Speyside Railway uh, from Keith that goes up to uh, the top there, uh, Dufftown to Keith, I should say, and I'm guessing uh, that's actually it. So maybe as part of its, its, its run, I mean, clearly we're not using steam engines these days to deliver goods and materials to the distillery, uh, but that's what it would have been back in the day. Um, for those of you who don't know, that there was a, a, a very thorough rail network around the Speyside district uh, that was originally built in the 1820s. Um, the distilleries pounced on that. You know, distilleries like Crag and Moore and, and, and Ardmore take, took great advantage of that and actually created their own sidings. Uh, Knock Do was another one, or and Knock, as some people uh, know it as, um, next to the railways. Uh, but the, the rail, the public rail network uh, in, in that part of Scotland was shut down in the 1960s. And so uh, whilst if the, uh, most of those branch lines that would go off to those areas are now in disrepair, they've been grown uh, over or they're just used for the, for the novelty train ride. So I expect that's what it is, Mark. Um, not sure I've given you a great answer there, but, yeah, it, it did catch my eye. Um, you don't see a, a steam train um, with steam coming out of it. <laughs> a distillery too many these days. Uh, Dave Cook, great question from you. Uh, is there aerial piping going from different buildings? Oh. Yes, indeed. You'll see that at lots of distilleries. Uh, very, very common, uh, particularly for the distilleries that uh, have set up stills in different areas uh, and need to get back to a common filling store uh, and the like. So, yes, you'll, you'll see that at plenty of places. Uh, in fact, if you go to um, Klein Leash and park your car there, you come out of the car park and you actually pass underneath a whole stack of them that are they're going down to the old Broad distillery as well. And a great comment from Darren here. Uh, and I've been saying this, hosting tastings for the society now for 20 odd years. Um, I love whiskey, which water can transform two experiences for one entry price. Exactly right. Two whiskies for the price of one. Darren, you're on fire tonight. I'm going to bring up this one as well. 
more tropical pineapple. Okay, interesting. So you went for the fruit angle. I, I, I was catching the florals, but yeah, the, the fruit's there as well. Lovely drop, lovely whiskey. Well, with that, we're going to take a change in tack. We've had four society whiskies, and there was a rule of thumb uh, back in the old days that uh, you can't do a society tasting without checking out um, uh, Isla. You had to have something peated in the mix, and we're going to do exactly that. We're going to move on to a, a peated whiskey. Uh, and our next dram tonight comes from the Isle of Isla. It's split personality. Wonderful 17-year-old. Let's get stuck in. Glug, glug, glug. Always nice when uh, you hear an Isle of Whiskey touching the sides of your glass. So, look, uh, we're on the Isle of Isla now. We've moved out of Speyside. And this is a treat. This is a fantastic story. Distillery number three, famous distillery. Uh, lays claim to being one of the oldest distilleries in Scotland. Big, big favourite amongst the society. Uh, you can see here we're, we're enjoying 3.324. Um, so 324 casks of this have been bottled by the society over time. And it's had an interesting history with the Australian branch. Uh, we had a period up until about two, three years ago where we were deliberately ordering and bottling and bringing in loads and loads of casks from uh, this distillery to the point where, and this is funny, uh, you know, members were making comments on our social pages, oh, God, not another distillery three, you know, can we see some other distilleries? And then, uh, you know, the society managed to uh, acquire a large parcel of casks, which we, you know, released over a period of time. We matured them in under, for different ages. Uh, we transferred a few of them to different casks to, to see uh, how they would change. We gave them some extra maturation and finishes. And um, uh, and and then uh, we had that dry spell for a patch, and all of a sudden, you know, members went from complaining about not seeing uh, enough of these casks, sorry, from seeing too many uh, of these to um, uh, not seeing enough. So uh, we're now thankfully uh, getting a few more back into the country again. And this is a 17-year-old, and I think this is a this is a distillery of all the other distilleries. I think this is one that really benefits from uh, from great age this this distillery in particular can mature its casts for long periods of time uh, and just really improve without being overwhelmed by the wood uh, or the oak which i know sounds like the same thing but they are different trust me and this is split personality and uh it's light it's in a lightly peated category now that's that's almost uh hand in hand with the distillery the distillery does not make the heaviest peated malt on on the island uh, you know, if you want to get technical about it, uh, distilleries like Ardbeg peat their 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 their, their malt to, to a fennel level of 55 parts per million. Uh, Lafroy and Lagavulin uh, peat theirs to 35. Uh, this distillery uh, is back down around about the 20 to 25 mark. So it's it's less peated than its uh, siblings on the island. And at 17 years old, that peat level drops even further. Uh, not many people appreciate this, but. Uh, as a whiskey matures over time, a peated whiskey, those peat levels, those phenols in the spirit actually reduce as well. So you can put something into the barrel and have a high peating level, but over time, those peated levels drop. So at 17 years old and from this distillery, it's not going to be the most heavily peated, hence it's in our lightly peated category. Um, and how often do you see a 17-year-old from a first fill, shaved, toasted and recharged barrique? extra mature so it spent 14 years in a bourbon hogshead and then the society transferred it for three years uh into a first fill str cast shave toasted recharge it's basically a secondhand barrel that's been given a new le lease of life and i'm just getting that lovely maritime smokiness that's what i love about the distillery many of you i'm sure have, have uh Seen the photos, uh, seen the story, you know, the, it's famous warehouse number one is below sea level. It's right on Loch and Dahl. It's got the, basically got the Atlantic Ocean blowing up against it. So it has this wonderful maritime character. What an extraordinary palette. There is the most delicious savoury note that comes out on that. 
By the way, in case you're wondering, um, I'm tasting these for the first time tonight. Uh, in case you're thinking I'm, I'm acting and putting on, you know, mock uh, surprise or something, uh, I did not taste these prior to, to the lineup. I thought I'd experience it uh, live in real time with the rest of you. And I'm just amazed at that, that savory note that comes through. Wow. So delicious, so tasty. And in case you're wondering, there are 13 bottles of this available on the website at the moment. 13 bottles that uh, you can grab. Wow. I now understand the name, Split Personality. On, on the nose, I was getting those very classic uh, 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 Isla Peter notes, the Maritime Spray. Not a lot of iodine, iodine, but certainly that little bit of peat and the sweet malt. And then you, had, you taste it on the palate and then you just hit with this wonderful savoury note, doughy bread, pastry kind of notes. There's a meatiness to it as well. Touch of uh, Bonox, you know, Bonox uh, gravy. Wow. So I mentioned earlier, uh, this distillery lays claim to um, being uh, one of the, the oldest in Scotland, founded in 1779. It's had a wonderful history. 1779, it was founded, uh, became uh, part of the DCL group, Diageo, in 1929. And then it was bought by Stanley P. Morrison in 1963. And that uh, Stanley P. Morrison founded Morrison Bermore Distillers. Uh, that group actually went on to own three distilleries, uh, this one, uh, and then Glengarry, um, and uh, Ockentoshan as well. And the, the group still owns those three distilleries, uh, but it was acquired by Suntory. Suntory bought a minority shareholding in, uh, I think it was 19, either 89 or 91, and then Suntory uh, acquired the entire business, 100% of the shares in 1994. So it's a Japanese-owned distillery since 1994. But that period that Stanley P. Morrison uh, owned it outright from 1963 uh, was just a, you know, a wonderful period. Some of the most famous whiskies of all time uh, come under his stewardship and ownership. You know, the Bicentenary Bottlings, uh, the Black Bamore as well. Um, amazing, amazing whiskies. And it's a distillery that uh, I, I really love and adore. And again, when we've done the, the ultimate whiskey tours to Scotland, uh, we've made sure that we pop into this distillery. Be keen to know if anyone watching along at home has uh, felt the need to add water. Uh, I don't. Again, it's, it's very, for me, it's very gentle, 56% ABV, uh, certainly not aggressive, no alcohol burn there. You're getting a little peep into the, into the still house here. And uh, interesting shaped stills. Now, you don't see too many uh, shape like that around the rest of Scotland. I feel like I should uh, flesh out some more information about that uh, that photo, but I'm actually just really enjoying the finish on the whiskey. Yeah, there's a there's a, a valid comment there as well. I'll, uh, I'll I'll bring that up. Darren, I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna send you uh, I'm gonna send you a little gift. Your, your comments uh, and input tonight have just been fantastic. Really like this is reflective of the OB, the official bottling. I agree with you. The DNA is there. I think if you nose and taste this, you're certainly going to, there, there are instant similarities with the 12 year old. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know if you can actually still get the 17 year old in Australia, but the, the old uh, 17 year old from this distillery, the commercial one, has a lot in common. As you say, rightly say, that DNA is there, but there's so much more going on with this. Um, and I guess we'll put that down to the fact that it had that extra maturation. It was transferred to a, uh, a first fill STR uh, barrique. Now, Barrique, of course, uh, is, a, is a French cask. Does that imply French oak? I'll be honest, I actually don't know. Uh, a Barrique is just the French word for cask. Does that imply that every wine cask used in France uh, is French oak? Not necessarily. So I don't know the answer to that. Uh, could it be the French oak that's contributing to the, these characteristics we're getting here? Possibly. Uh, but that's just a bit of speculation. I think what's more important, I think, again, I, touching back on a theme I said earlier, we tend to get a bit caught up in the in the the, the trivia and the minutiae of, of such things. Um, ask yourself a more global question: Do I enjoy this? Is it tasty? Uh, is it something I want to go back and pour another glass of? Uh, for me, the answer to all those questions is yes. Just magnificent. Wow. 
again, just check out the finish on that. It's, 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 a, it's the overlooked part of the tasting experience. People go to the nose and go, oh, yeah, I smell this. And then we, we take a sip and go, oh, I taste that. And we often forget or, or overlook the uh, the experience on the finish. Once you've – let me just change the little screens here for a moment. Once you finish uh, uh, swallow a, a whiskey, the experience doesn't end. You've still got residual spirit on your palate. You've got uh, residual vapors up in your nasal cavity. And it's so important to assess the, the finish of a whiskey. Some whiskies uh, you'll take a sip of, you'll swallow, and then they'll they'll turn dry or bitter or astringent. For me, the marker of a good whiskey is is the finish. Does it hold its line? Is it consistent? Um, we also measure the length of a finish. You know, some whiskies you can take a sip of, you can swallow, and it just evaporates on your palate straight away, and, and you almost forget that you uh, you just had a taste of it. You need to go back for another sip straight away. A great whiskey is one where the finish just goes on and on and on. There's a crescendo of flavor. It develops further. And um, and you find uh, you're in no hurry to go back for a second sip because you're still enjoying the experience that the first sip gave you. That, to me, is an amazing finish. And I think there's a bit of that going on with this, this whiskey here. There's a comment here from someone. I'll be honest and say I don't quite get the reference there. You might That's a bit too cryptic for me. You might need to fill that in. Fill me in on that one. And Darren, another fantastic comment there. The whiskeys which keep on giving. So, folks, look, that's about all I had uh, prepared for tonight. Um, not too much reference back to classical music other than the fact that we've enjoyed some whiskeys that uh, all came from distilleries founded during that classical period. Um, uh, by all means, if you've got our, our malts and music outturn from uh, March and April, you'll see each of the whiskeys in that outturn had a little... Uh, 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 Q code thing, Q scan, QR scan that you could do that we match to a tune. By all means, if you've got it in your CD or LP collection at home, get out your classic composers, have a listen to uh, to Brahms and, and Beethoven uh, and all the rest of it. And I think it's not, not a bad soundtrack to listen to whilst you enjoy these amazing drams. Folks, it has been an absolute pleasure drinking with you tonight. I hope you've enjoyed these amazing whiskies. Uh, some of them, as we've gone through tonight, are available on the website for you to try. Really look forward to next month. Keep an eye out for your uh, uh, your May outturn and the wonderful uh, uh, festival tastings we're going to have around the country. And uh, I look forward to your company then and to the next time and our virtual tasting next month when, uh, with a bit of luck, Matt will be back and we'll do that one in tandem. Folks, have yourself a fantastic evening. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much indeed. Good night.